Carly Fairhurst was born in 1986 in Hindley, Wigan, to parents Trevor and Sheila. She was a beautiful baby. She was a proper sensitive little girl, you know. Um, she had a lot of feeling and a lot of love. And... She loved animals. She used to have a little pet bee in a box. Uh, she charmed the birds out of the trees. She had a cat of her own and a dog, and she loved them. She was a proper animal-loving little girl, and very happy little girl. She was so happy, you know, I got my little family, and a boy and a girl, you couldn't ask for any more, and they were both lovely, sweet little children. She had a larger brother, you know. They used to play together all the time. Carly enjoys school and is a high achiever. She's also popular with her peers. We met in year nine in high school, in cooking. I started seeing a brother, and then from then on, we just got really, really cool. She was my best friend. We had such a laugh. Any problems I had, it's her that I'd speak to. She was a very fun-loving person, obsessed with her hair and her makeup and clothes, and um, she was just, I think she just loved life in general. Anything at all that was exciting. She, she wanted to do it. Carly has a special bond with her mum, Sheila. She was really close with her mum because they're into exactly the same sort, they're exactly the same with the hair and the makeup and going out and having a laugh and stuff. And she, she loved her mum to bits. It was a lot closer than a normal family. Sheila and Trevor always, were always there. They're like one of the, the best families you can, you can imagine. They didn't hide anything from each other. She had no secrets from her mum at all. But Carly's close relationship with her mum is about to be tested to the limit. She drops a bombshell. When she was about 15, she, she came home this particular day and said, uh, I'm going to be a pen friend. I said, who is she? She hasn't got right to Pilka. Well, he had a reputation from the age of 10. And, uh, every, you know, I said, no way. You're not writing to him. It's every mother's worst nightmare. Darren Pilkington is one of the most notorious young offenders in Wigan. Pilkington is serving a four-year sentence for the manslaughter of Paul Akister after he and his brother Andrew killed him in a fight in November 2000. It had been a street fight. I never heard of fighting like this. I didn't... I didn't even know fighting like that existed with this stamp on it, on people's heads and they were jumping on his chest. Uh, can somebody do that to another person? And they're supposed to be one of the friends. Forensic psychologist Dr Kerry Nixon works with Merseyside Police, assessing risk factors in serious violent offenders, and she's been looking into Pilkington's background. He's off the chart in terms of risk. I mean, he's classed as a very high-risk offender. And part of that is the level of violence that he exhibited during the manslaughter. I knew that uh, the guy had, had killed someone before, but you don't uh, think that your daughter would strike up a relationship with someone like that. She said, but mum, it's only pen friends. You need somebody to write to. I said, you're not Carly, you don't know where it'll end that. When we look at violent offenders, in relation to domestic abuse offenders. If somebody has a previous history of violence, that makes them more risky. Although Pilkington is a convicted killer, he is also a friend of her brother, Michael. Carly wants to give Pilkington a chance. And she isn't the only one of her friends writing to someone in prison. A lot of the lads that we hung about with ended up going to prison. And it was just a thing for girls to do to write to them. Nothing usually ever happened. It did just sort of fizzle out. They had a lot of girls writing to them. Um, and she decided to write to Darren. According to Carly's friends, it was her kind nature and her ability to see the best in people that led her to write to Pilkington. She did see the, the good side in everybody, um, no matter what they were like, what they'd done. If she thought they was all right, she'd, she'd be friends with them. I think Carly, wanted to give Darren a chance to see if maybe she could make him better. Kayla was a caring person and a, a loving person. He, he was just totally the opposite. Always in trouble. 
For Carly's parents, their daughter writing to a killer is too much to bear. A lot of her friends at that time were going through a stage where uh, they only liked bad boys and, uh, you know, I suppose it was like a status symbol, I don't know. I think that was the attraction with them and... I just wish it had never happened. The attraction of a bad boy, the peer pressure from friends, and the belief that there is good in Pilkington means Carly puts her family's fears aside and soon becomes infatuated with her pen pal. But would this tale of forbidden love have a happy ending? He said, I love your daughter, Mrs. Ferris, I love her. And I thought, oh, this is it. He does actually care about her. He does love her. Carly rang me and she just said, can I come to your house? So she had teeth marks in the side of her nose. Trevor had all the me and he's arm round her and Michael were in the other side and held her. And I kept telling you, you're going to be all right, you're not going to do it anymore. Carly Fairhurst had a happy childhood. Then at 15, she stunned her parents when she told them she was going to be a pen pal to convicted killer Darren Pilkington. It was like the main focus point of her day-to-day life was him waiting to hear off him. She was writing a lot of letters, um, sending a lot of photos. If we went out, it was always, she, she was very camera happy. Pilkington showed a loving and caring side in his letters, and Kylie is falling in love with her pen pal. The things that he said to her made her feel like a princess. It would do any girl. If that was me and I read that, I'd think exactly the same. You wouldn't think, you'd feel like that this man's going to take care of her. But for psychologist Emma Kenny, a family and relationships expert, Carly's dreams are not based on reality. The problem when you are writing letters is this. You feel very engaged in the process. But actually, it's all about you having the experience with the letter writing process. You don't really get to know the person that you're writing to. So the picture that she was building up about the man that she was writing to was something that she was creating in her own mind and not the reality of the man who was waiting in a cell. After a few months of letter writing without her parents' knowledge, Carly starts receiving phone calls from prison. I remember being at a race one night to stop over and she was sat at the bottom of the stairs where the phone was. And uh, she said, they'll be ringing me soon. And my mum will go mad if she finds out. And he rang her and she was all excited and giggly on the phone and stuff. Um, very, very exciting for her. Uh, loved speaking to him. Anything to do with Darren, that was all it was about, was Darren. So he's got this window of opportunity here where he's in prison and he's got nothing else that he can do. So he's got the attention of Carly and he can woo her and present this facade and he's got that time to seduce Carly from inside prison. It makes her feel wanted, approved of, needed, important. These are very heady experiences for any teenager at a point where her development is so, so becoming a young woman. With Pilkington declaring his undying love for Carly in the letters, her friends realise she has fallen for him. She's kind of fell in love with him just through the letter stage, you know what I mean? Not even actual face in contact. I was thinking to myself, like, you don't want to be getting involved with somebody like that. But how could I tell her that, you know what I mean? It's, it's her choice who she gets involved with. 15 years of age, you're not thinking about the long-term consequences, you're feeling the immediate gratification. And if somebody's being incredibly nice to you, you can't help but be moved by that. Carly's mum, Sheila, is unaware of her daughter's feelings toward Pilkington. We thought, it's, it's got to fizzle out. She's only 15, she's growing up, she's not experienced life. It'll fizzle out, nothing can come of it. Um, and then she started receiving letters with um, SWALK on the back, and, and I thought, this is not a friendship, this is something a little bit more. And I'm, I'm sad to say, but I'm glad I did it. I asked him to talk, 
And I realised in the, the, he was declaring what he felt for her, so she'd been doing with him. Sheila told me, and uh, I hit the roof, and I had an argument with Carly again over it, but uh, it made no difference. She denied it at first, and then she just said, yeah, I am. I love him. Carly and Pilkington are now a couple. She promises to wait for him on the outside and dedicated all her time to her now boyfriend. Friday night, Saturday night, that, that's all she did, stop in her room, watch TV and write letters. Like two star-crossed lovers, Carly and Pilkington took any opportunity they could to have contact with each other. We used to go down, like, where Carl lived, it was like a long track, the old railway. If you walked down there, the prison used to be there. She'd shout over and we could be there for an hour, two hours at a time sometimes, shouting for Darren. I did think it was mad what she were doing, but she's just a girl, wasn't she? She liked a lad who was in jail. In fact, this is a case of forbidden love, and many young people are very attracted to situations that they feel they shouldn't be in or that they can change for the better. It's a heady mix of emotions, and on both sides there is a passion and an obsession that is clear. To the despair of her parents, a headstrong, love-struck Carly starts visiting Pilkington in prison. On one particular occasion, I went, um, she introduced me to him. I remember sitting in the, the waiting area while she went in first to tell him that I'd come with her, and, and I thought, what's she seeing in that? What's she seeing in? Um, and he she took me and said, you know, introduced us, and I thought, If he's liked. <laughs> but the relationship doesn't fizzle out, and Sheila's worst fears come true. Carly stopped seeing her friends, stopped going out, withdrew to her room for long periods of time, stopped engaging with the family as she had done before, and instead concentrated all her focus and efforts on having this relationship. There was a lot of people that was scared of um, Darren and um, his reputation. As soon as they heard that Carly had got with Darren, they, they didn't want to, like, be too close to Carla in a way. And I, I don't think Carla wanted to have her mates involved with her while she was involved with him. I think the fact that her friends uh, started to pull away from her as well as her isolating herself from her friends is very indicative of how people were in fear of Pilkington, which adds to the risk. If he can be violent to everybody, he's much more likely to be violent to anybody who gets in his way. After 18 months of writing to each other, to Carly's delight, Pilkington is released from jail after serving only two years of a four-year sentence for manslaughter. Carly's parents decide to trust their daughter's judgment and give Pilkington another chance. That day, they were going up and meeting the friends up the street and I walked down with them. And he had his arm round her and he was cuddling her and kissing her and he said, I love your daughter, Mrs. Furrest, I love her. And I thought, oh, this is it. He does actually care about her. He does love her. Whilst no parent wants their child to live with a killer, the truth is that people have done things and regretted them hugely and actually transformed their lives because of them. As far as Trevor and Sheila were concerned, they trusted their daughter. They trusted her choices. She had made good choices before. This was just taking it one step further and trusting her choice in a partner, giving him the benefit of the doubt. Pilkington appears to be a changed man. He seemed uh, that he wanted to be with her. He seemed uh, that he loved her at the time. But obviously he didn't because of his, uh, his actions. 
Pilkington promises Carly a new start. And at just 17 years old, she moves in with him. But Pilkington soon breaks his promises. After spending almost two years saving herself for him, Carly is devastated when he starts cheating on her with other women. I was thinking it was too weak. That been, he'd been on the outside, that's when the behaviour started happening. He would go off and leave her and um, mess about with girls and come back and tell her about it. For Dr Kerry Nixon, Pilkington's cheating is a way of exerting control over Carly. He was engaging in uh, cheating behaviour, infidelity, but letting her know about it. Again, almost showing off to himself and those around him at how much he was in control of Carly, that he could get away with this type of behaviour and she was still there for him. As well as cheating on her, Pilkington demeans Carly in public. It's, it's another level of control. It's another way of making her feel um, bad about herself, demeaning her, and the more that he puts her down, the more he is in control of her. Um, and the more low self-esteem she has, the easier it is for him to control her. Popular Carly, who previously surrounded herself with friends, now prefers to spend all her time with Pilkington. She wouldn't go out that much. She wouldn't meet up with her friends like she used to. Um, she only came to see me, I think it was three times, um, while she was with him. It just, it all seemed very odd because she, she's never ever been away from her friends before. It's always been her friends come first. Her self-esteem would slowly and gradually be being eroded. Her confidence levels would be dropping. She would be trying to seek desperately the man that she had once recognised in those letters. As her self-esteem level is changed and becomes lower and lower, the likelihood of his power growing over her becomes bigger and bigger. That's the reality in these abusive situations. The more power he takes, the less power she holds. Is the man Carly fell in love with beginning to show his dark side? Desperate to make it work and still believing she can change him, Carly forgives his infidelity and stays in the relationship. Then she starts picking up injuries, but refuses to blame her boyfriend. And I said, Carly, what's that bruise in your arm? And she said, Oh, I fell over or banged it or whatever, and then she'd come home and her arm had been a sling, and I'd say, what, what have you done that? Oh, I fell over when I was up King Street, and then fingers were strapped together, but numerous things, and I, I just believed her. Um, I honestly thought she would have told us. Every dad's worried about his daughter, isn't he? But uh, looking back, I, I should have been a lot more worried than what I thought it was at the time. The question for psychologist Emma Kenny is, why would Carly suffer in silence? She'd given up a great deal to be with him. People's expectations were that this relationship will fail, and she had this amazing two years of writing to a man that she'd fell in love with, who'd been kind and charming to her. The reality of who he was versus her beliefs of who he was are at such polarities that she has to believe she can change him because he's not the guy she used to know. Pilkington's violent control over Carly does show itself when Carly has a rare night out with best mate Sian. We'd been out to a pub in Wigan and she was all dressed up like usual with all the makeup on her nice. And I just remember him coming up upstairs in the pub and starting to scream at her. Um, telling her that she shouldn't be out and he wanted to get home and they started arguing and he threw a glass at her and she went after him and I just thought, she's crazy. After he's done that, why would you go after somebody? According to Dr Kerry Nixon, Pilkington can do no wrong in Carly's eyes. He's so convinced of her uh, utter devotion to him that he can treat her any way he wants and get away with it. You know, he's managed to manipulate her so successfully that she will sit there, have a glass thrown at her, and he can get away with doing that. 
It's around a year after Pilkington's release from prison, and Carly's parents get a worrying phone call. We got a call from the duty manager of Morrison's uh, saying that your daughter was here and she'd been uh, attacked by a girl or girls. And Carly was in the staff room, all her nose was blooded and all the front of it was full of blood. Uh, next thing, the police arrived and uh, they was interviewing Carly and uh, we, we had not a clue what had gone on. It came out later that Pilkington had attacked Carly in their flat. But that night, she denied it. And together, they concocted a story for Sheila. I said, well, it, well he's done it. He said, some girls came to the door. And uh, she said, these girls had been saying that they'd been going with him. And Carly had cr kicked off with them. And the girls had hit her. Carly was trying to protect them. She didn't want them to realise that she was in any distress. And at the same time, Trevor and Sheila trusted their daughter. It's testament to how much they cared for each other, that they believed one another's points of view. But their trust in their daughter was based on lies. Carly's relationship with Pilkington was a far cry from the fairy tale he promised her in the letters two years earlier. His violence appears to be escalating, and he attacks her again, this time in a public place. Carly rang me, and she just said, can I come to your house? And I said, well, what's the matter? And she said, Darren's rammed my head into a hand dryer, and he's bitten the, my nose. So I, I said, yeah, come straight away. She was crying, and I was out. She was devastated, so she had teeth marks inside of her nose when she got to my house. And that, the pub was, I'd say, a 10 minute walk from my house. So for the bike mark still to be in her nose, it must have bitten hard for the bike marks to still be there, to still be quite deep. And she came up and she had like a, a bruise on her head. And she just said to me, we promise, please don't tell her, Mike. So I promised and I never did. I never told her so. For Carly to admit she's a victim of domestic abuse is her darkest taboo. And Dr Kerry Nixon believes her and Pilkington's relationship is hurtling towards a violent and tragic conclusion. He bites her face. He gives her bloody noses. He's throwing glasses at her. Um, you know, high levels of violence. And throughout all of that, she doesn't report it and she continues to lie for him. So that would have continued. That wasn't going to stop. That would have only continued and it would have got worse. And it was a potential homicide waiting to happen. They'd ended up in an argument at the top of the stairs. He said Carly uh, ran at him. He tried to fend her off and slapped her and uh, she ended up losing her balance and falling down stairs. If I'd conducted a risk assessment, he would have been a very high risk of killing Carly. Her eyes were just black and she was stirring straight up. For 19-year-old Carly Fairhurst, her teenage romance had turned into a nightmare. According to friends, the man of Carly's dreams, convicted killer Darren Pilkington, is now abusing her and the violence is escalating. What we can definitely say is whilst the violence didn't end, there was always a chance that he could kill her. On the 31st of January, 2006, just under two years after his release from prison for killing his friend, Pilkington and Carly have an argument in a pub and she returns home alone. On the night of the attack, she texts me and she said, do you want to come down for a drink with your partner? Uh, me and Darren are fell out and I'm in the house on my own. And I didn't have a babysitter and I explained, I'm sorry, like, I haven't got anybody to watch, watch my son. I'll try and catch up soon. It was very strange that she contacted me that night and asked me to go around to the house because I'd never been to anywhere where they lived. I'd only ever seen her at her mum and dad's or out and about. But I just thought if they've had an argument, she must want to talk to somebody. That was the last time Sian spoke to her friend. The next morning, 
Carly's parents receive a phone call. It was the call they had feared the moment she started writing to Pilkington less than four years earlier. I answered it and passed it to Sheila because I heard his voice. It was Pilkington and he said, uh, Carly's in the hospital. I said, what was she done? He said, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what she's done. She's, uh, she, she, had a, she had a fight with some girls. And then Sheila shot up and she said, Carly's in hospital. So she shot off in the car. Pilkington, the man of Carly's dreams that had promised to treat her like a princess, had called an ambulance for her that morning. I got to car park. He was waiting on me, what are you been living? So we go, we go inside and I said, where is she? So he said, she's in here and he just went straight to this door, no respect to her, straight to this door. Um, intensive care. He doesn't care what people think about him. He comes from um, a background of, of crime, his criminal activity, previous convictions, a high level of antisocial behaviour. Sheila's beloved daughter is fighting for her life. I won't prepare for what I'll go and see when I got there. I went in and she would just lie on this bed and it, she was connected up to all these machines. I've never seen them on TV. I didn't never experienced that before. And she was she was just lied there. He just said, look at her, look at her. What's up with her? And he went for a touch of ice and I slapped his hand and said, don't. Don't do that, she's connected up to all these machines. And I realised, I thought, she's really in a bad way. The only man that knows what has happened to Carly is Pilkington, and he begins a web of deceit. We sat in the waiting room, and I said, what, I, what, asked, what happened? He said, well, we was out having a drink, he said, and then we decided to go on. We said, and oh, no, we're walking home together. These girls jumped on her and they started fighting her. He said, I'll tell you what, she can give as good as she gets. He said, uh, she didn't half hold her own with ease. And I thought, I'm thinking to myself, oh, Carly's not a fighter. He said, and then we went home. He said, and I was going out with my mate. He said, and he said, so I, I let, I said, what, you left her at home? He said, yeah. I said, and she didn't bother about that, because she always wanted to come home. And no, she was all right. And I never thought anything, I just believed in gullible that I am. And, and then uh, the police came because she had sus suspicious circumstances, she had marks around her neck. So they, they, they came to arrest him and um, was he taking him away? I was sticking up for him. What, what, what were you taking him? You were thinking, well, she, she's got one to him as soon as she wakes up. Pilkington is taken away by police and is sticking to his original story. Carly is transferred to Hope Hospital. Carly's injuries as a result of what happened to her were some bruising to her brain and some bleeding in her brain as well. With any injury comes subsequent swelling, which in increase the pressure within her brain. Associated with her being unconscious for a long period of time, it was thought that she'd probably aspirated or inhaled some of her stomach contents which had gone into her lungs, which developed into a pneumonia, which then led to multi-organ failure. Um, that, in addition to her brain injuries, were, were life-threatening, really. Over the next few days, Carly's family hold a bedside vigil for her refusing to leave her side, but things go from bad to worse. They said at one point that uh, they might have to cut the top of her skull to release the pressure on her brain. I mean, oh, God, that, that's awful, you know, that, that was bad. And then, <sighs> and then I thought, well, if it means that she's going to survive. So we, we said, you know, we got used to that idea, and then they come back and they said, they can't do that, because the, if they did, the pressure was so great in the skull, a brain would just mushroom out and they would never get it back in again. So we're just willing and just willing to survive. As Carly's situation deteriorates, 
News of Pilkington's arrest by police is picked up by local reporter Charles Graham, who covered the killing of Paul Akerster six years earlier. Immediately put two and two together and thought, Hindley man, Darren Pilkington, Paul Akerster, he's done it again. Pilkington continues to lie, but this time Carly cannot lie for him. It's too late for her to tell the truth. He came up with so many different stories for different people that it was difficult to know what exactly had happened from the outset. His first account suggested that he'd just come home for, from being out all night and found her injured at the bottom of the stairs. That was a made-up story. He, he, he misled the 999 operator. Then when the paramedics arrived, after Curly was lying at the bottom of the stairs for eight hours, he, he lied to the paramedics as well telling them the same story, and then he lied to the police. He did seem to be the prime suspect. There's no evidence to suggest that he had been out all night, uh, and under a, a certain amount of questioning from detectives, um, he then said that he had actually been uh, at the house during the night. He changed his story because he was lying. Looking at the backgrounds of Pilkington, with his previous offending behaviour, combined with his treatment of Carly, and the factors that are in that relationship. If I'd conducted a risk assessment, he would have been a very high risk of killing Carly. But the truth is about to come out. Under intense questioning from police, Pilkington finally admits he knows what happened to Carly. After the four days of questioning and, and detention in the local police station, he said that they'd been falling out and it ended up in an argument at the top of the stairs. He said Carly uh, ran at him. He tried to fend her off and slapped her, and uh, she ended up losing her balance and falling downstairs. He said fell, not pushed or punched. Uh, she was lying at the bottom of the stairs, and he thought she was asleep. She went and got her and thrown it over her, and uh, he said he lied down with her for eight hours. She was bleeding from her ears, her nose and her mouth. And uh, he, he thought that, because she was bleeding, especially from her mouth, that she'd been cleaning her teeth. And her gums used to bleed a bit. He left her for eight hours at the bottom of the stairs. You know, things might have been different if she was breathing the contents of her own stomach in while she was lying there. And he says he lied with her. While Pilkington is charged with assault, Carly continues to fight for her life. For eight days, her family maintain a bedside vigil, willing her to pull through. All we could do was massage your legs because of all the pressure made you made to swell up, you know, all the drugs they were giving her. That morning, I knew that Carly was potentially going to die, and I knew that in order for Sheila and Trevor to have any type of closure, I saw it as my role to try and make Carly dying as a positive experience as I could in order to help them recover. The nurse, Jess, she said, uh, said can I touch her? You know, when you're going, going to machine up. <laughs> And Trevor said, well, will you turn the machines round so we can't see them because we'll, we'll be watching for I mean, you know, what's happening. So they, they put them behind the curtain and they sat on the outside. And I said, can I, can I hold her? She said, if you want, you can get in bed with her. So I got in bed with her, put my hair around her. Trevor had all the men, he's out round her, and Michael were in the other side and held her. And I kept telling you, you're going to be all right, you're not going to do it anymore. <laughs> then, then this machine just stopped making a noise. <laughs> said, she's gone. <laughs> she's died. <laughs> You just saw all the, all the life just drained out of her, and she'd gone. I didn't think she would die. 
I never thought she'd die. <laughs> the evening that uh, we noticed the clock on the wall, it was a pendulum clock, it used to keep excellent time. Uh, and it was wound up, by the way. Uh, it had stopped at 10 to 10, which is the exact minute that Carly died. It's eight weeks before Trevor and Sheila are able to bury their beloved daughter. The day we buried Carly, it was... Uh, it had been raining for, for ages, and then on the day of the funeral, it was a, a lovely sunny day. So many people turned up. It was all in the streets. I'd never like to go through that experience again. It felt wrong, it felt unfair that they should have to be doing this at, at her age. As Trevor and Sheila prepare to say their final goodbyes, Carly's friends have some shocking news about what they witnessed in Carly and Pilkington's relationship. And while we was waiting, we got talking to some of Carly's friends and they said they needed to speak up and uh, told us what had gone on. They told us that he'd been abusing her for a couple of years, on and off. They had witnessed the fact and they couldn't say nothing because Carly had sworn them to secrecy. Please don't tell me mum and dad, otherwise my dad will, my dad will kick off and it'll cause a big ruckus and... Try to think of all the the incidents that you look back on and you think it was him. You can imagine her feeling, and we then went over to the grave and we looked in and Sheila collapsed. She collapsed at the graveside. And I was thinking, why have I not spotted it? The guilt was coming back then. You never think that will happen to one of your own. I was thinking, God, I can't wait, get up there. I wanted him to get 16 to 18 years. You could see he had no remorse whatsoever, nothing. And he started screaming at him, you killed my baby, you killed my baby. In February 2006, 19-year-old Carly Fairhurst died in her mother's arms. Ten months later, her boyfriend, Darren Pilkington, is about to face trial for her murder. I thought the one thing I can do for my daughter now is speak up in court and I'll have my say, I'll defend her, you know, and let people know what he's like. Personally, I didn't want to see him. No, Sheila did, I just didn't even want to see his face at all. And I wanted him to get 16 to 18 years. That was my expectations of it. And I was thinking, God, I can't wait, get up there. I can't wait and just say my bit. And while we were sat outside, they adjourned, I think it was for lunch or whatever. When we come back, they said, uh, you're not going to go up. Uh, he's pleaded guilty to manslaughter. When Trevor and Sheila are allowed in court for sentencing, they come face to face with their daughter's killer. He stood up. And I thought, I just, I just flipped and I started screaming at him. And uh, shouted, you've killed, you killed my baby, you've killed my baby. You could see he had no remorse whatsoever, nothing. He just stood there like it was just another court, court case, just a little burglary or whatever he'd done. I remember the, the barrister saying, Lee, um, the sentence that he's, he'll be given is uh, an indeterminate sentence and he's, he'll be given three years uh, and 53 days. And I just, I brought her down, I said, is that all she's worth? Is that all she's worth to you, three year and 53 days? I'll never forget that as long as I live. Just gobsmacked. Just couldn't believe it. So he's not getting a life sentence, he said, unfortunately not. You know, there's a justice in that. Who are the, the victims here? Beyond me. Although he is accountable for Carly's death, Dr Kerry Nixon believes Pilkington didn't intend to kill Carly. 
I don't think he probably intended to kill her that night because I think he was quite happy having her adoring him. He set up home with her. He had her doing what he wanted. She was a pretty girl on his arm. She adored him. She probably looked after him. She probably took care of him, made his dinner, etc. I think he was quite enjoying life with Carly and would have carried on in that life for a, for a long time to come, still abusing her. So he probably didn't intend to kill her that night. There's not an hour of the day goes by but that I don't think of her. That's all I can say, really. She was everything. She was my best friend. My little girl. She loved... She had an infectious laugh. It was just silly as anything. <laughs> we had the same sense of humour. I miss the music. She <laughs> used to... Do little dances. <laughs> She's my little girl. <laughs> In the years since Carly's death, Trevor and Sheila have dedicated their lives to raising awareness of domestic violence. They have raised thousands of pounds for victim support counselling services through the Carly Fund. They decided to set up the Carly Fund and uh, we didn't realise how, how big it would take off. And that's, in turn, that's kept us going and Carly's not died in vain and she's helping other people, even though she's not here. And the amount of people, you, you know, are suffering from domestic violence and you... And they put up with it because, well, they think they have to. And, but there's people out there who will help and um, they just need to ask for, for it. If you'd have told me then that they would have gone on to achieve what they've achieved today, I would have said never, never in a million years, because they were just bereft. But they just used this grief as, a, as ammunition to do good for the people. I think it's amazing. Instead of being driven apart by all of these events, instead, this couple have cemented and furthered their relationship. And Carly would be incredibly proud of the fact that her parents are still together, loving each other and remembering her well. And that's something that Pilkington will never be able to take away from them. We mm. just stuck together, haven't we? Yeah. And done it as a, a team, haven't we? <laughs> Honestly, it's my rock. I don't know what I'll do without it. Curly will never be forgotten when she's helping other people, even though she's not here, and she's what Curly would be doing if she was. <laughs>